The Doctrine of Repentance by Thomas Watson Published first in 1668 As read by Samantha Elosais The Epistle to the Reader Christian Reader The two great graces essential to a saint in this life are faith and repentance. These are the two wings by which he flies to heaven. Faith and repentance preserve the spiritual life as heat and radical moisture do the natural. The grace which I am going to discuss is repentance. Chrysostom thought it the fittest subject for him to preach upon before the emperor Arcadius. Augustine, one of the greatest of the church fathers, who died in 430, called by Watson as Austin, caused the penitential psalms to be written before him as he lay upon his bed, and he often perused them with tears. Repentance is never out of season. It is of as a frequent use as the artificer's tool or the soldier's weapon. If I am not mistaken, practical points are more needful in this age than controversial and polemical. I had thought to have smothered these meditations in my desk, but conceiving them to be of great concern at this juncture of time, I have rescinded my first resolution and have exposed them to a critical view. Repentance is purgative. Fear not the working of this pill. Smite your soul, said Chrysostom. Smite it. It will escape death by that stroke. How happy it would be if we were more deeply affected with sin and our eyes did swim in their orb. We may clearly see the Spirit of God moving in the waters of repentance, which, though troubled, are yet pure. Moist tears dry up sin and quench the wrath of God. Repentance is the cherisher of piety, the procurer of mercy. The more regret and trouble of spirit we have first at our conversion, the less we shall feel afterwards. Christian, do you have a sad resentment of other things and not of sin? Worldly tears fall to the earth, but godly tears are kept in a bottle. Psalms 56 verse 8 Judge not holy weeping superfluous. Tertullian thought he was born for no other end but to repent. Either sin must drown or the soul burn. Let it not be said that repentance is difficult. Things that are excellent deserve labor. Will not a man dig for gold in the ore, though it make him sweat? It is better to go with difficulty to heaven than with ease to hell. What would the damned give? that they might have a herald sent to them from God to proclaim mercy upon their repentance. What volleys of sighs and groans would they send up to heaven? What floods of tears would their eyes pour forth? But it is now too late. They may keep their tears to lament their folly sooner than to procure pity. Oh, that we would therefore, while we are on this side of the grave, make our peace with God. Tomorrow may be our dying day. Let this be our repenting day. How we should imitate the saints of old who embittered their souls and sacrificed their lusts and put on sackcloth in the hope of white robes. Peter baptized himself with tears and that devout lady, Paula, of whom Jerome writes, like a bird of paradise, bemoaned herself and humbled herself to the dust for sin. Besides our own personal miscarriages, The deplorable condition of the land calls for a contribution of tears. Have we not lost much of our pristine fame and renown? The time was when we sat as princes among the provinces, Lamentations 1 verse 1, and God made the sheaves of other nations do obeisance to our sheaf, Genesis 37 7. But has not our glory fled away as a bird, Hosea 9 verse 11? And what severe dispensations are yet behind, we cannot tell. Our black and hideous vapors have ascended. We may fear loud thunderclaps should follow. And will not all this bring us to our senses and excite in us a spirit of humiliation? Shall we sleep on the top of the mast when the winds are blowing from all the quarters of heaven? Oh, let not the apple of our eye cease. Lamentations 2.18 I will not launch forth any further in a prefatory discourse, but that God would add a blessing to this work and so direct this arrow, that though shot at rovers, it may hit the mark 
and that some sin may be shot to death, shall be the ardent prayer of him who is the well-wisher of your soul's happiness, Thomas Watson, May 25th, 1668. Chapter 1. A Preliminary Discourse St. Paul, having been falsely accused of sedition by Tertullus, we have found this man a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition, Acts 24, verse 5, makes an apology of himself, makes an apology for himself, before Festus and King Agrippa in chapter 26 of the book of Acts. Paul proves himself an orator. He courts the king first by his gesture. He stretched forth his hands as was the custom of orators. He courts the king second by his manner of speech. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused. Acts 26, verse 2. Paul then treats of th three things, and in so deep a strain of rhetoric as almost to have converted King Agrippa. First, he speaks of the manner of his life before his conversion. After the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Verse 5. During the time of his unregeneracy, he was zealous for traditions, and his false fire of zeal was so hot that it scorched all who stood in his way. Many of the saints did I shut up in prison. Verse 10. Secondly, he speaks of the manner of his conversion. I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun. Verse 13. This light was no other than what shone from Christ's glorified body. And I heard a voice speaking unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? The body being hurt, the head in heaven cried out. At this light and voice Paul was amazed and fell to the earth. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Verses 14 and 15. Paul was now taken off from himself. All opinion of self-righteousness vanished, and he grafted his hope of heaven upon the stock of Christ's righteousness. Third, he speaks of the manner of his life after his conversion. He who had been a persecutor before now became a preacher. Arise, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness of those things which thou hast seen. Verse 16. When Paul, this vessel of election, was savingly wrought upon, he labored, he labored to do as much good as previously he had done hurt. He had persecuted saints to death before. Now he preached sinners to life. God first sent him to the Jews at Damascus and afterwards enlarged his commission to preach to the Gentiles. And the subject he preached on was this, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Verse 20, a weighty and excellent subject. I shall not dispute the priority whether faith or re repentance goes first. Doubtless repentance shows itself first in the Christian's life. Yet I am apt to think that the seeds of faith are first wrought in the heart. As when a burning taper is brought into a room, the light shows itself first. But the taper was before the light, so we see the fruits of repentance first but the beginnings of faith were there before. That which inclines me to think that faith is seminally in the heart before repentance is because repentance, being a grace, must be exercised by one that is living. Now, how does the soul live but by faith? The just shall live by his faith. Hebrews 10, verse 38. Therefore, there must be some, first some seeds of faith in the heart of, the, of a penitent, otherwise... It is, as, it is a dead repentance, and so of no value. Whether faith or repentance goes first, however, I am sure that repentance is of such importance that there is no being saved without it. After Paul's shipwreck, he swam to shore on planks and broken pieces of the ship. Acts 27, verse 44. In Adam we all suffered shipwreck, and repentance is the only plank left us after shipwreck to swim to heaven. It is a great duty incumbent upon Christians solemnly to repent and turn unto God. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 3, verse 2. Repent, therefore, and be converted, 
that your sins may be blotted out. Acts 3.19 Repent of this thy wickedness. Acts 8 verse 22 In the mouth of three witnesses this truth is confirmed. Repentance is a foundation grace, not laying again the foundation of repentance. Hebrews 6 verse 1 That religion which is not built upon this foundation must needs fall to the ground. Repentance is a grace required under the gospel. Some think it legal, but the first sermon that Christ preached, indeed the first word of his sermon was repent, Matthew 4, verse 17. And his farewell that he left when he was going to ascend was that repentance should be preached in his name, Luke 24, verse 47. The apostles did all beat upon this string. They went out and preached that men should repent, Mark 6, verse 12. Repentance is a pure gospel grace. The covenant of works admitted no repentance. There it was, sin and die. Repentance came in by the gospel. Christ has purchased in his blood that repenting sinners shall be saved. The law required personal, perfect, and perpetual obedience. It cursed all who could not come up to this. Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written, in the book of the law, to do them. Galatians 3.10 It does not say, He that obeys not all things, let him repent, but let him be cursed. Thus, repentance is a doctrine that has been brought to light only by the gospel. How is repentance wrought? The manner in which repentance is wrought is, first, partly by the word, When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Acts 2, verse 37. The word preached is the engine God uses to effect repentance. It is compared to a hammer and to a fire. Jeremiah 23, verse 29. The one to break, the other to melt the heart. How great a blessing it is to have the word which is of such virtue dispensed. And how hard they who put out the lights of heaven will find it to escape hell. Secondly, by the Spirit. Ministers are but the pipes and organs. It is the Holy Ghost breathing in them that makes their words effectual. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Acts 10.44 The Spirit in the word illuminates and converts. When the Spirit touches a heart, it dissolves with tears. I will pour upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the Spirit of grace and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn. Zechariah 12, verse 10 It is wonderful to consider what different effects the word has upon men. Some at a sermon are like Jonah. Their heart is tender and they let tears fall. Others are no more affected with it than a deaf man with music. Some grow better by the word, others worse. The same earth which causes sweetness in the grape causes bitterness in the wormwood. What is the reason the word works so differently? It is because the Spirit of God carries the word to the conscience of one and not another. One has received the divine unction and not the other. 1 John 2 verse 20 O pray that the dew may fall with the manna, that the Spirit may go along with the word. The chariot of ordinances will not carry us to heaven unless the Spirit of God join himself to this chariot. Acts 8, verse 29. Chapter 2, Counterfeit Repentance To discover what true repentance is, I shall first show what it is not. There are several deceits of repentance, which might occasion that saying of Augustine that repentance damns many. He meant a false repentance. A person may delude himself with counterfeit repentance. First, The first deceit of repentance is legal terror. A man has gone on long in sin. At last God arrests him, shows him what desperate hazard he has run, and he is filled with anguish. Within a while the tempest of conscience is is blown over and he is quiet. Then he concludes that he is a true penitent because he has felt some bitterness in sin. Do not be deceived. This is not repentance. Ahab and Judas had some trouble of mind. It is one thing to be a terrified sinner and another to be a repenting sinner. 
Sense of guilt is enough to breed terror. Infusion of grace breeds repentance. If pain and trouble were sufficient to repentance, then the damned in hell should be most penitent, for they are most in anguish. Repentance depends upon a change of heart. There may be terror, yet with no change of heart. Number two, another deceit about repentance is resolution against sin. A person may purpose and make vows, yet be no penitent. Thou saidst, I will not transgress. Jeremiah 2 verse 20. Here was a resolution, but see what follows. Under every green tree thou wanderest playing the harlot. Notwithstanding her solemn engagements, she played fast and loose with God and ran after her idols. We see by experience experience what protestations a person will make when he is on his sickbed if God should recover him again. Yet he is as bad as ever. He shows his old heart in a new temptation. Resolutions against sin may arise, first, from present extremity, not because sin is sinful, but because it is painful. This resolution will vanish. Second, from fear of future evil and apprehension of death and hell. I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. Revelation 6 verse 8 What will not a sinner do? What vows will he not make when he knows he must die and stand before the judgment seat? Self-love raises a sick bed vow and love of sin will prevail against it. Trust not to a passionate resolution. It is raised in a storm and will die in a calm. Third, the third deceit about repentance is the leaving of many sinful ways. It is a great matter, I confess, to leave sin. So is so dear is sin to a man that he will rather part with a child than with a lust. Shall I give the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Micah 6, verse 7. Sin may be parted with, yet without repentance. First, a man may part with some sins and keep others, as Herod reformed many things that were amiss, but could not leave his incest. Second, An old sin may be left in order to entertain a new, as you put off an old servant to take another. This is to exchange a sin. Sin may be exchanged and the heart remain unchanged. He who was a prodigal in his youth turns usurer in his old age. A slave is sold to a Jew. The Jew sells him to a Turk. Here the master is changed, but he is a slave still. So a man moves from one vice to another, but remains a sinner still. Third, a sin may uh, may be left not so much from strength of grace as from reasons of prudence. A man sees that though such a sin be for his pleasure, yet it is not for his interest. It will eclipse his credit, prejudice his health, impair his estate. Therefore, for prudential reasons, he dismisses it. True leaving of sin is when the acts of sin cease from the infusion of a principle of grace as the air ceases to be dark from the infusion of light. Chapter 3 The Nature of True Repentance 1. I shall next show what gospel repentance is. Repentance is a grace of God's Spirit whereby a sinner is inwardly humbled and visibly reformed. For a further amplification, know that repentance is a spiritual medicine made up of six special ingredients. 1. Sight of sin. 2. Sorrow for sin. 3. Confession of sin. 4. Shame for sin. 5. Hatred for sin. 6. Turning from sin. If any one is left out, it loses its virtue. Ingredient 1. Sight of Sin The first part of Christ's physic is Isav, Acts 26.18. It is the great thing noted in the prodigal's repentance. He came to himself, Luke 15, verse 17. He saw himself a sinner and nothing but a sinner. Before a man can come to Christ, He must first come to himself. Solomon, in his description of repentance, 
considers this as the first ingredient, if they shall bethink themselves, 1 Kings 8, verse 47. A man must first recognize and consider what his sin is and know the plague of his heart before he can be duly humbled for it. The first creature God made was light, so the first thing in a penitent is illumination. Illumination. Now ye are light in the Lord, Ephesians 5, 8. The eye is made both for seeing and weeping. Sin must first be seen before it can be wept for. Hence I infer that where, where there is no sight of sin, there can be no repentance. Many who can spy faults in others see none in themselves. They cry that they have good hearts. Is it not strange that two should live together and eat and drink together, yet not know each other? Such is the case of a sinner. His body and soul live together, work together, yet he is unacquainted with himself. He knows not his own heart, nor what a hell he carries about with him. Under a veil of deformed face is hid. Persons are veiled over with ignorance and self-love. Therefore they see not what deformed souls they have. The devil does with them as the falconer with the hawk. He blinds them and carries them hooded to hell. The sword shall be upon his right eye. Zechariah 11.17 Men have insight enough into worldly matters, but the eye of their mind is smitten. They do not see any evil in sin. The sword is upon their right eye. Ingredient 2. Sorrow for sin. I will be sorry for my sin. Psalm 38, verse 18. Ambrose calls sorrow the embittering of the soul. The Hebrew word to be sorrowful signifies to have the soul, as it were, crucified. This must be in true repentance. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn. Zechariah 12, verse 10 as if they did feel the nails of the cross sticking in their sides. A woman may as well expect to have a child without pangs as one can have repentance without sorrow. He that can believe without doubting suspect his faith, and he that can repent without sorrowing suspect his repentance. Martyrs shed blood for Christ, and penitents shed tears for sin. She stood at Jesus' feet, weeping, Luke 7, verse 38. See how this limbeck dropped. Footnote. Limbeck, that is, alembic, old distilling apparatus for refining liquids. End of footnote. The sorrow of her heart ran out at her eye. The brazen labor for the priest to watch, to wash in, Exodus 30, verse 18, typified a double labor. The labor of Christ's blood we must wash in by faith, and the labor of tears we must wash in by repentance. A true penitent labors to work his heart into a sorrowing frame. He blesses God when he can weep. He is glad of a rainy day, for he knows that it is a repentance he will have no cause to repent of. Though the bread of sorrow be bitter to the taste, yet it strengthens the heart. Psalm 104 verse 15, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10. This sorrow for sin is not superficial. It is a holy agony. It is called in scripture a breaking of the heart. The sacrifices of God are a broken and a contrite heart. Psalm 51 verse 17. And a rending of the heart. Rend your heart. Joel 2:13. The expressions of smiting on the thigh. Jeremiah 31:19. Beating on the breast. Luke 18 verse 13 putting on of sackcloth, Isaiah 22.12, plucking off the hair, Ezra 9.3, all these are but outward signs of inward sorrow. This sorrow is, first, to make Christ precious. Oh, how desirable is a Savior to a troubled soul! Now Christ is Christ indeed, and mercy is mercy indeed. Until the heart is full of compunction, it is not fit for Christ. How welcome is a surgeon to a man who is bleeding from his wounds. This sorrow is, secondly, to drive out sin. Sin breeds sorrow, and sorrow kills sin. Holy sorrow is the rhubarb to purge out the ill humors of the soul. It is said that the tears of vine branches are good to cure the leprosy. 
Certainly the tears that drop from the penitent are good to cure the leprosy of sin. The salt water of tears kills the worm of conscience. This sorrow is, thirdly, to make way for solid comfort. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Psalm 126 verse 5 The penitent has a wet seed time but a delicious harvest. Repentance breaks the abscess of sin and then the soul is at ease. Hannah, after weeping, went away and was no more sad. 1 Samuel 1.18 God's troubling of the soul for sin is like the angel's troubling of the pool. John 5 verse 4 which made way for healing. But not all sorrow evidences true repentance. There is as much difference between true and false sorrow as between water in the spring which is sweet and water in the sea which is briny. The Apostle speaks of sorrowing after a godly manner, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 9. But what is this godly sorrowing? There are six qualifications of it. The first qualification, true godly sorrow is inward. It is inward in two ways. First, it is a sorrow of the heart. The sorrow of hypocrites lies in their faces. They disfigure their faces. Matthew 6, verse 16. They make a sour face, but their sorrow goes no further. Like the dew that wets the leaf, but does not soak to the root. Ahab's repentance was in outward show. His garments were rent, but not his spirit. 1 Kings 21, 27. Godly sorrow goes deep, like a vein which bleeds inwardly. The heart bleeds for sin. They were pricked in their heart. Acts 2 verse 37 As the heart bears a chief part in sinning, so it must in sorrowing. Secondly, it is a sorrow for heart sins, the first outbreaks and rising of sin. Paul grieved for the law in his members. Romans 7:23. The true mourner weeps for the stirrings of pride and concupiscence. He grieves for the root of bitterness, even though it never blossoms into act. A wicked man may be troubled for scandalous sins. A real convert laments heart sins. The second qualification. Godly sorrow is ingenious. It is sorrow for the offense rather than for the punishment. God's law has been infringed. His love abused. This melts the soul in tears. A man may be sorry, yet not repent, as a thief is sorry when he is taken, not because he stole, but because he has to pay the penalty. Hypocrites grieve only for the bitter consequence of sin. I have read of a fountain that only sends forth streams on the evening before a famine. Likewise, their eyes never pour out tears except when God's judgments are approaching. Pharaoh was more troubled for the frogs and river of blood than for his sin. Godly sorrow, however, is chiefly for the trespass against God, so that even if there were no conscience to smite, no devil to accuse, no hell to punish, yet the soul would still be grieved because of the prejudice done to God. My sin is ever before me. Psalm 51 verse 3 David does not say, The sword is threatened ever before me, but my sin. Oh, that I should offend so good a God, that I should grieve my comforter. This breaks my heart. Godly sorrow shows itself to be ingenious because when a Christian knows that he is out of the gunshot of hell and shall never be damned, yet still he grieves for sinning against that free grace which has pardoned him. The third qualification. Godly sorrow is fiducial, that is, trustful. It is intermixed with faith. The father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Mark 9, verse 24. Here was sorrow for sin checkered with faith, as we have seen a bright rainbow appear in a watery cloud. Spiritual sorrow will sink the heart if the pulley of faith does not raise it. As our sin is ever before us, so God's promise must be ever before us. As we much feel our sting, so we must look up to Christ, our brazen serpent. Some have faces so swollen with worldly grief 
that they can hardly look out of their eyes. That weeping is not good which blinds the eye of faith. If there are not some dawnings of faith in the soul, it is not the sorrow of humiliation, but of despair. The fourth qualification. Godly sorrow is a great sorrow. In that day shall there be a great mourning, as the mourning of Hadadrimen. Zechariah 12, verse 11. Two sons did set that day when Josiah died, and there was a great funeral mourning. To such a height must sorrow, be, must sorrow for sin be boiled up. Pectora ab imo suspiria, sighing from the bottom of one's heart. Question 1. Do all have the same degree of sorrow? Answer. No. Sorrow does recipere magus and minus, produce greater or lesser sorrows. In the new birth all have pangs, but some have sharper pangs than others. First, some are naturally of a more rugged disposition, of higher spirits, and are not easily brought to stoop. These must have greater humiliation, as a knotty piece of timber must have greater wedges driven into it. Second, some have been more heinous offenders, and their sorrows must be suitable to their sin. Some patients have their sores let out with a needle, others with a lance. Flagitious, that is, extremely wicked sinners, must be more bruised with the hammer of the law. Third, some are designed and cut out for higher service, to be eminently instrumental for God, and these must have a mightier work of humiliation pass upon them. Those whom God intends to be pillars in his church must be more hewn. Paul, the prince of the apostles, who was to be God's ensign bearer to carry his name before the Gentiles and kings, was to have his heart more deeply lanced by repentance. Question 2. But how great must sorrow for sin be in all? The answer? It must be as great as for any worldly loss. Turgescent lumina fletu, eyes are swollen with weeping. They sh shall look upon me whom they pierced, and they shall mourn as for an only son. Zechariah 12, verse 10. Sorrow for sin must surpass worldly sorrow. We must grieve more for offending God than, the, than for the loss of dear relations. In that day did the Lord God of hosts call to weeping and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth. Isaiah 22.12 This was for sin. But in the case of the burial of the dead, we find God prohibiting tears and baldness. Jeremiah 22.10 and Jeremiah 16.6 To intimate that sorrow for sin must exceed sorrow at the grave, and with good reason, for in the burial of the dead it is only a friend who departs, but in sin God departs. Sorrow for sin should be so great as to swallow up all other sorrow, as when the pain of the stone and gout meet, the pain of the stone swallows up the pain of the gout. We are to find as much bitterness in weeping for sin as ever we found sweetness in committing it. Surely David found more bitterness in repentance than ever he found comfort in Bathsheba. Our sorrow for sin must be such as makes us willing to let go of those sins which brought in the greatest income of profit or delight. The physic shows itself strong enough when it has purged out our disease. The Christian has arrived at a sufficient measure of sorrow when the love of sin is purged out. The fifth qualification. Godly sorrow in some cases is joined with restitution. Whoever has wronged others in their estate by unjust fraudulent dealing ought in conscience to make them recompense. There is an express law for this. He shall recompense his trespass with the principle thereof, and add unto it the fifth part thereof, and give it unto him against whom he hath trespassed. Numbers 5, verse 7. Thus Zacchaeus made restitution. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Luke 19, verse 8. When Selimus, the great Turk, lay upon his deathbed, being urged by Pyrrhus to put a charitable, to put to charitable use that wealth he had wronged the Persian merchants of, 
He commanded rather that it should be sent back to the right owners. Shall not a Christian's creed be better than a Turk's Koran? It is a bad sign when a man on his deathbed bequeaths his soul to God and his ill-gotten goods to his friends. I can hardly think God will receive his soul. Augustine said, Without restitution, no remission. And it was a good speech of old Latimer. If ye restore not goods unjustly gotten, you shall cough in hell. Question 1. Suppose a person has wronged another in his estate and the wronged man is dead. What should he do? Answer. Let him restore his ill-gotten goods to that man's heirs and successors. If none of them be living, let him restore to God. That is, let him put his unjust gain into God's treasury by relieving the poor. Question 2. What if the party who did the wrong is dead? Answer. Then they who are his heirs ought to make restitution. Mark what I say. If there be any who have estates left them, and they know that the parties who left their estates had defrauded others and died with that guilt upon them, then the heirs or executors who possess those estates are bound in conscience to make restitution. Otherwise they entail the curse of God upon their family. Question 3. If a man has wronged another and is not able to restore, what should he do? Answer. Let him deeply humble himself before God, promising to the wronged party full satisfaction if the Lord make him able, and God will accept the will for the deed. The sixth qualification. Godly sorrow is abiding. It is not a few tears shed in a passion that will serve the turn. Some will fall a weeping at a sermon, but is like an April shower, soon over, or like a vein opened and presently stopped again. True sorrow must be habitual. O Christian, the disease of your soul is chronic and frequently returns upon you. Therefore you must be continually physic physicking yourself by repentance. This is that sorrow which is after a godly manner. Use, how far are they from repentance who never had any of this godly sorrow? Such are, first, the papists, who leave out the very soul of repentance, making all penitential work consist in fasting, penance, pilgrimages, in which there is nothing of spiritual sorrow. They torture their bodies, but their hearts are not rent. What is this but the carcass of repentance? Second, carnal Protestants, who are strangers to godly sorrow. They cannot endure a serious thought, nor do they love to trouble their heads about sin. Paracelsus, a Swiss phys physician in the 16th century, spoke of a frenzy some will have, which will make them die dancing. Likewise, sinners spend their days in mirth. They fling away sorrow and go dancing to damnation. Some have lived many years, yet never put a drop in God's bottle, nor do they know what a broken heart means. They weep and wring their hands as if they were undone when their estates are gone, but have no agony for soul, of soul for sin. There is a twofold sorrow. Firstly, a rational sorrow, which is an act of the soul, whereby it has a displacency of, against sin and chooses any torture rather than to admit sin. Secondly, there is a sensitive sorrow, which is expressed by many tears. The first of these is to be found in every child of God, but the second, which is a sorrow running out at the eye, all have not. Yet it is very commendable to see a weeping penitent. Christ counts as great beauties those who are tender-eyed, and well may and well may sin make us weep. We usually weep for the loss of some great good. By sin we have lost the favor of God. If Micah did so weep for the loss of a false god, saying, Ye have taken away my gods, and what have I more? Judges 18.24 Then well may we weep for our sins, which have taken away the true God from us. Some may ask the question whether our repentance and sorrow must always be alike. Although repentance must be always kept alive in the soul, yet there are two special times when we must renew our repentance in an extraordinary manner. One, before the receiving of the Lord's Supper. This spiritual Passover is to be eaten with bitter herbs. 
Now our eyes should be fresh broached with tears and the stream of sorrow overflow. A a repenting frame is a sacramental frame. A A broken heart and a broken Christ do well agree. The more bitterness we taste in sin, the more sweetness we shall taste in Christ. When Jacob wept, he found God, and he called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. Genesis 32.30 The way to find Christ comfortably in the sacrament is to go weeping thither. Christ will say to a humble penitent as to Thomas, Reach thither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. John 20, verse 27 And let those bleeding wounds of mine heal thee. Second, another time of extraordinary repentance is at the hour of death. This should be a weeping season. Now is our last work to be done for heaven, and our best wine of tears should be kept against such a time. We should repent now that we have sinned so much and wept so little that God's bag has been so full and his bottle empty. Job 14.17 We should repent now that we repented no sooner, that the garrisons of our hearts held out so long against God ere they were leveled by repentance. We should repent now that we have loved Christ no more, that we have fetched no more virtue from Him and brought no more glory to Him. It should be our grief on our deathbed that our lives have had so many blanks and blots in them, that our, duty, that our duties have been so fly-blown with sin, that our obedience has been so imperfect and we have gone so lame in the ways of God. When the soul is going out of the body, it should swim to heaven in a sea of tears. Ingredient number three, confession of sin. Sorrow is such a vehement passion that it will have vent. It vents itself at the eyes by weeping and at the tongue by confession. The children of Israel stood and confessed their sins. Nehemiah 9 verse 2 I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their their offense Hosea 5.15 It is a metaphor alluding to a mother who when she is angry goes away from the child and hides her face till the child acknowledges its fault and begs pardon. Gregory Nazianzen a 4th century defender of the faith calls confession a salve for a wounded soul. Confession is self-accusing. Lo, I have sinned. 2 Samuel 24.17 Indeed, among other men it is otherwise. No man is, bo- no man is bound to accuse himself, but desires to see his accuser. When we come before God, however, we must accuse ourselves. O Lord, I, even I, who made myself what I am, change my hardness of heart. And the truth is that by this self-accusing we prevent Satan's accusing. In our confessions we tax ourselves with pride, infidelity, passion, so that when Satan, who is called the accuser of the brethren, shall lay these things to our charge, God will say, They have accused themselves already. Therefore, Satan, thou art non-suited. Thy accusations come too late. The humble sinner does more than accuse himself. He, as it were, sits in judgment and passes sentence upon himself. He confesses that he has deserved to be bound over to the wrath of God. And hear what the Apostle Paul says, If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31 But have not wicked men like Judas and Saul confessed sin? Yes, but theirs was not a true confession. That con- That confession of sin may be right and genuine, these eight qualifications are requisite. Number one, confession must be voluntary. It must come as water out of a spring freely. The confession of the wicked is extorted like the confession of a man upon a rack. When a spark of God's wrath flies into their conscience or they are in fear of death, then they will fall to their confessions. Balaam, when he saw the angel's naked sword, could say, I have sinned, Numbers 22, verse 34. But true confession drops from the lips as myrrh from the tree or honey from the comb freely. I have sinned against heaven and before thee, Luke 15, 18. The prodigal charged himself with sin before his father charged him with it. 
Second, confession must be with compunction. The heart must deeply resent it. A natural man's confession runs through him as water through a pipe. They do not at all affect him, but true confession leaves heart-wounding impressions on a man. David's soul was burdened in the confession of his sins. As in heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. Psalm 38, verse 4 It is one thing to confess sin, and another thing to feel sin. Third, confession must be sincere. Our hearts must go along with our confessions. The hypocrite confesses sin, but loves it, like a thief who confesses to stolen goods, yet loves stealing. How many confess pride and covetousness with their lips, but roll them as honey under their tongue? Augustine said that before his conversion, he confessed sin and begged power against it, but his heart whispered within him, Not yet, Lord. He was afraid to leave his sin too soon. A good Christian is more honest. His heart keeps pace with his tongue. He is convinced of the sins he confesses and abhors the sins he is convinced of. Fourth, in true confession a man particularizes sin. A wicked man acknowledges he is a sinner in general. He confesses sin by wholesale. His confession of sin is much like Nebuchadnezzar's dream. I have dreamed a dream, Daniel 2 verse 3, but he could not tell what it was. The thing is gone from me, Daniel 2 verse 5. In the same way a wicked man says, Lord, I have sinned, but does not know what the sin is. At least he does not remember, whereas a true convert acknowledges his particular sins. As it is with a wounded man who comes to the surgeon and shows him all his wounds, Here I was cut in the head, there I was shot in the arm. So a mournful sinner confesses the several distempers of his soul. Israel drew up a particular charge against themselves. We have served Balaam, Judges 10, verse 10. The prophet recites the very sin which brought a curse with it. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants the prophets which spake in thy name, Daniel 9, 6. By a diligent inspection into our hearts, we may find some particular sin indulged. Point to that sin with a tear. Fifth, a true penitent confesses sin in the fountain. He acknowledges the pollution of his nature. The sin of our nature is not only a privation of good, but an infusion of evil. It is like a canker to iron or stain to scarlet. David acknowledges his birth sin. I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 51, verse 5. We are ready to charge many of our first sins to Satan's temptations, but this sin of our nature is holy from ourselves. We cannot shift it off to Satan. We have a root within that bears gall and wormwood. Deuteronomy 29, verse 18. Our nature is an abyss and seminary of all evil, from whence come those scandals that infest the world. It is this depravity of nature which poisons our holy things. It is this which brings on God's judgment and makes our mercy stick in the birth. Oh, confess sin in the fountain. Sixth, sin is to be confessed with all its circumstances and aggravations. Those sins which are committed under the gospel horizon are doubtless dyed in grain. Confess sins against knowledge, against grace, against vows, against experiences, against judgments. The wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them. For all this they sinned still. Psalm 78, verse 31 and 32. These are killing aggravations which do accent and enhance our sins. Seventh, in confession we must so charge ourselves as to clear God. Should the Lord be severe in his providences and and unsheath his bloody sword, Yet we must acquit him and acknowledge he has done us no wrong. Nehemiah, in his confessing of sin, vindicates God's righteousness. Howbeit thou art just in all that is brought upon us. Nehemiah 9.33 Mauritius, a Roman emperor from 582 to 602, Phocas became emperor after Mauritius, the emperor, when he saw his wife slain before his eyes by Phocas, cried out, Righteous art thou, O Lord, in all thy ways. Eighth, 
we must confess our sins with a resolution not to act them over again. Some run from the confessing of sin to the committing of sin, like the Persians who have one day in the year when they kill serpents and after that day suffer them to swarm again. Likewise, many seem to kill their sins in their confessions and afterward let them grow as fast as ever. Cease to do evil. Isaiah 1, 16 It is vain to confess we have done those things which we ought not to have done and continue still in doing so. Pharaoh confessed he had sinned in Exodus 9, verse 27, but when the thunder ceased, he fell to his sin again. He sinned yet more and hardened his heart. Exodus 9.34 Origen, one of the early Greek fathers who died in 254, calls confession the vomit of the soul whereby the conscience is eased of that burden which did lie upon it. Now when we have vomited up sin by confession, we must not return to this vomit. What king will pardon that man who, after he has confessed his treason, practices new treason? Thus we see how confession must be qualified. Use number one. Is confession a necessary ingredient in repentance? Here is a bill of indictment against four sorts of persons. One, it reproves those that hide their sins, as Rachel hid her father's images under her. Genesis 31 verse 34. Many had rather their, have their sins covered than cured. They do with their sins as with their pictures. They draw a curtain over them, or as some do with their bastards, smother them. But though men will have no tongue to confess, God has an eye to see. He will unmask their treason. I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Psalm 50 verse 21 Those iniquities which men hid in their hearts shall be written one day on their foreheads as with the point of a diamond. They who will not confess their sin as David did that they may be pardoned, shall confess their sin as Achan did, that they may be stoned. It is dangerous to keep the devil's counsel. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Proverbs 28.13 2. It reproves those who do indeed confess sin, but only by halves. They do not confess all. They confess the pence, but not the pounds. They confess vain thoughts or badness of memory but not the sins they are most guilty of, such as rash anger, extortion, uncleanness, like he in Plutarch who complained his stomach was not very good when his lungs were bad and his liver rotten. But if we do not confess all, how should we expect that God will pardon all? It is true that we cannot know the exact catalogue of our sins, but the sins which come within our view and cognizance and which our hearts accuse us of must be confessed as ever we hope for mercy. 3. It reproves those who in their confessions mince and extenuate their sins. A gracious soul labors to make the worst of his sins, but hypocrites make the best of them. They do not deny that they are sinners, but they do what they can to lessen their sins. They indeed offend sometimes, but it is their nature, and it is long of such occasions. These are excuses rather than confessions. I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, because I feared the people. 1 Samuel 15.24 Saul lays his sin upon the people. They would have him spare the sheep and oxen. It was an apology, not a self-indictment. This runs in the blood. Adam acknowledged that he had tasted the forbidden fruit, but instead of aggravating his sin, he translated that is, removed it from himself to God. The woman thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Genesis 3.12 That is, if I had not this woman to be a tempter, I would not have transgressed. They charged the gods with the crime. Ovid That is a bad sin indeed that has no excuse, as it must be a very coarse wool which will take no dye. How apt we are to pair and curtail sin, and look upon it through the small end of the perspective, that is, the telescope or microscope, that it appears but as a little cloud, like a man's hand. 1 Kings 18, verse 44. Number 4. It reproves those who are so far from confessing sin 
that they boldly plead for it. Instead of having tears to lament it, they use arguments to defend it. If their sin be passion, they will justify it. I do well to be angry. Jonah 4 verse 9 If it be covetousness, they will vindicate it. When men commit sin, they are the devil's servants. When they plead for it, they are the devil's attorneys, and he will give them a fee. Use number two. Let us show ourselves penitents by sincere confession of sin. The thief on the cross made a confession of his sin. We indeed are justly condemned. Luke 23 verse 41 And Christ said to him, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Luke 23 verse 43 Which might have occasioned that speech of Augustine's, that confession of sin shuts the mouth of hell and opens the gate of paradise that we may make a free and ingenuous confession of sin, let us consider, 1. Holy confession gives glory to God. My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the, God, to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. Joshua 7.19 A humble confession exalts God. What a glory is it to him, that out of our own mouths he does not con- d- condemn us. While we confess sin, God's patience is magnified in sparing and his free grace in saving such sinners. 2. Confession is a means to humble the soul. He who subscribes himself a hell-deserving sinner will have little heart to be proud. Like the violet, he will hang down his head in humility. A true penitent confesses that he mingles sin with all he does and therefore has nothing to boast of. Uzziah, though a king, yet had a leprosy in his forehead, he had enough to abase him. Second Chronicles 26.19 So a child of God, even when he does good, yet acknowledges much evil to be in that good. This lays all his feathers of pride in the dust. 3. Confession gives vent to a troubled heart. When guilt lies boiling in the conscience, confession gives ease. It is like the lancing of an abscess which gives ease to the patient. 4. Confession purges out sin. Augustine called it the expeller of vice. Sin is a bad blood. Confession is like the opening of a vein to let it out. Confession is like the dung gate through which all the filth of the city was carried forth. Nehemiah 3.13 Confession is like pumping at the leak. It lets out that sin which would otherwise drown. Confession is the sponge that wipes the spots from off the soul. 5. Confession of sin endears Christ to the soul. If I say, I am a sinner, how precious will Christ's blood be to me? After Paul has confessed a body of sin, he breaks forth in gratulatory triumph for Christ. I thank God through Jesus Christ. Romans 7 verse 25. If a debtor confesses a judgment, but the creditor will not exact the debt, instead appointing his own son to pay it, will not the debtor be very thankful? So when we confess the debt, and that even though we should forever lie in hell, we cannot pay it, but that God should appoint his own son to lay down his blood for the payment of our debt, how is free grace magnified, and Jesus Christ eternally loved and admired? 6. Confession of sin makes way for pardon. No sooner did the prodigal come with a confession in his mouth, I have sinned against heaven, than his father's heart did melt towards him, and he kissed him. Luke 15.20 When David said, I have sinned, the prophet brought him a box with a pardon. The Lord hath put away thy sin. 2 Samuel 12.13 He who sincerely confesses sin has God's bond for a pardon. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. 1 John 1, nine. Why does not the Apostle say that if we confess, he is merciful to forgive our sins? No, he is just, because he has bound himself by promise to forgive such. God's truth and justice are engaged for the pardoning of that man who confesses sin and comes with a penitent heart by faith in Christ. 7. How reasonable and easy is this command that we should confess sin? a. It is a reasonable command, for if one has wronged another, what is more rational than to confess he has wronged him? 
we, having wronged God by sin, how equal and consonant to reason it is that we should confess the offense. B. It is an easy command. What a vast difference is there between the first covenant and the second. In the first covenant it was, If you commit sin, you die. In the second covenant it is, If you confess sin, you shall have mercy. In the first covenant no surety was allowed. Under the covenant of grace, if we do but confess the debt, Christ will be our surety. What way could be thought of as more ready and facile for the salvation of man than a humble confession? Only acknowledge thine iniquity. Jeremiah 3 verse 13 God says to us, I do not ask for sacrifices of rams to expiate your guilt. I do not bid you part with the fruit of your body for the sin of your soul. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. Do but draw up an indictment against yourself and plead guilty, and you shall be sure of mercy. All this should render this duty amiable. Throw out the poison of sin by confession, and this day is salvation come to thy house. There remains one case of conscience. Are we bound to confess our sins to men? The papists insist much upon auricular confession. One must confess his sins in the ear of the priest or he cannot be absolved. They urge, Confess your sins one to another, James 5.16. But this scripture is little to their purpose. It may as well mean that the priest should confess to the people as well as the people to the priest. Auricular confession is one of the Pope's golden doctrines. Like the fish in the gospel, it has money in its mouth. When thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money. Matthew 17, verse 27 But though I am not for confession to men in a popish sense, yet I think in three cases there ought to be confession to men. First, firstly, where a person has fallen into scandalous sin and by it has been an occasion of offense to some and of falling to others, he ought to make a solemn and open acknowledgement of his sin that his repentance may be as visible as his scandal. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 6 and 7 Secondly, where a man has confessed his sin to God, yet still his conscience is burdened and he can have no ease to it in his mind, it is very requisite that he should confess his sin to some prudent, pious friend who may advise him and speak a word in due season. James 5, 16 It is a sinful modesty in Christians that they are not more free with their ministers and other spiritual friends in unburdening themselves and opening the sores and troubles of their souls to them. If there is a thorn sticking in the conscience, it is good to make use of those who may help to pluck it out. Thirdly, where any man has slandered another and by clipping his good name has made it weigh lighter, he is bound to make confession. The scorpion carries its poison in its tail the slanderer in his tongue. His words pierce pierce deep like the quills of the porcupine. That person who has murdered another in his good name or by bearing false witness has damaged him in his estate ought to confess his sin and ask for, for forgiveness. If thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24 How can this reconciliation be effected but by confessing the injury? Till this is done, God will accept none of your services. Do not think the holiness of the altar will privilege you. Your praying and hearing are in vain till you have appeased your brother's anger by confessing your fault to him.